That cheap chemical I bought from Zepp Manufacturing didn't work. Welcome to Berwick Academy's 204th commencement. It says something about the class of 1995, something we have long suspected, but rarely admitted, that Monday's weather forecast was uh, for a flood today. 
Thank you all for joining us on this glorious day. Reverend James Christensen, pastor of the First Parish Federated Church of South Berwick, will offer the invocation. Let's be together in a word of prayer. Gracious God, we open our hearts and our minds to you that in this hour, asking that you be present with us. Amid the excitement of the day, the senior class assembled, the robes, the pageantry, the diplomas, and families gathered, cause us to reflect and rejoice. To reflect and rejoice on your goodness, which has guided us from the dependency of infancy to the doorstep of adulthood. To reflect and rejoice in your mercy, which has provided us with visions of truth and mystery, experiences of success and failure, and through it all has given us a chance to learn both pride and humility and to reflect and rejoice in your grace, which has taught us to love and care, to forgive and be forgiven, and to trust and strive and taste success. We give you grateful thanks, O oh God, for families which have supported these students with sacrifice and labor and love, for teachers who have inspired and challenged and most of all cared, and for classmates with whom learning about the world and the subjects and the self has taken place. Almighty God, be present with us in this hour inspiring us to reflect and rejoice and to be truly thankful. Amen. Please be seated. It is my distinct pleasure to ask Marie Donahue to mark the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Marie is no stranger to this commencement or this place. Uh, she first participated here in 1937 as the valedictorian of that class. She has been a teacher, she has been a trustee, she has been a friend. She is also the author of our history, The Old Academy on the Hill. Will you please join me in welcoming Marie Donahue, valedictorian from the class of 1937. Thank you very much, Hap. <clears throat> Fifty years ago, on a rare June day like this, members of the Burke Academy class of 1945 gathered, just as you have this morning, to receive their hard-earned diplomas. Only a month before, on May 8th, World War II in Europe had ended. Three months later, on August 15th, the war with Japan would be over. That war to end wars, which you know about principally through your study of it in your American history course, the members of the class of 1945 knew firsthand. It had raged throughout all their years here at the academy. Rationing of food, fuel, and gasoline brought the war home to them, as did blackouts and air raid warning drills. Teachers and students took first aid courses served as air raid wardens up here on Powder House Hill, joined the United St Service Organization. Some left school to enlist in the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, or Air Force. Many of the schoolmates of the class of 1945, including older brothers and sisters, fought in that war. More than 250 Berwick Academy graduates served in all branches of the service in all areas of the fighting, from the Aleutian Islands in the north to Guadalcanal in the South Pacific, in Africa, Italy, Germany, France, the Pacific Islands, Burma, India. Several were injured or taken prisoner. Ten Berwick alumni gave their lives, the last full measure of devotion. Their names are enshrined on a bronze plaque that you passed every day as you went from math to English class in Fog Memorial. We would like to pay tribute to those valiant men now with the tolling of the Fog Bell. E. Forrest Bassett, class of 1940. Edward W. Bennett, class of 1943.
Richard L. Chick, class of 1937, my classmate. Walter J. Clark, class of 1928. M. Francis Doherty, class of 1942. Loris W. Giraud, class of 1932. George E. Merrill, class of 1938. Fernand J. Roberge, class of 1940. Joseph H. Simpson, class of 1925. Joseph W. Woods, class of 1932. The tolling of the bell brings to mind the words of John Donne, 17th century English poet. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Thank you, Marie. Governor Alexander, Mr. Hatt, Reverend Christensen, Marie, trustees, overseers of the academy, faculty, family, and friends, it is my honor to present the class of 1995. The history of the academy stretches back to the date of the Bill of Rights. As we see from Marie's presentation, the history of our nation has touched the history of our academy, and the history of our academy has touched the history of our nation. Berwickians have moved on from this day, from their classes, from their exams, from their papers, from their sports, from their commencements, to play roles large and small in the lives of our communities and the lives of our nation. Today, we noted and thanked 10 such Berwickians, a roll of honor. And today, we mark the passage of another class, another roll of honor, from our hilltop to the larger stage that awaits them. Today's roll of honor is small in numbers, but great in talents. The class of 1995, to start with, set a new standard for the academy academically. With three National Merit finalists, Poppy Hagen, Sarah Hamilton, and Devin Kearns, with the highest ever class average SAT scores in the history of the school, with four cum laude students, Poppy, Sarah, Devin, and Corinna Choi, with four members of the National French Honor Society, Kiernan Miller, Katie Schulte, Poppy, and Sean Roberts, with three members of the National Spanish Society, Devin, Poppy, and Sarah. The colleges saw that intellectual quality very early. Molly Camp led off the parade of acceptances in the fall. The early decision applications included Devon to Georgetown, Mark Spenson to Kenyon, Katie to Mount Holyoke, Julie Lynch to UVM, Cutter Hutton to Rhode Island School of Design, and Eric Hiltonen to Eckerd. Did Sarah, or did John Sevigny, or did Connor Guy have the most acceptances? They're still arguing about that. 
Merit scholarships went to Alex Holmes, Steve Dow, and Poppy. Tiernan may have closed the parade this week with her acceptance to UNC Chapel Hill. Scholars, scholars, absolutely, but also much more. Our captains included Bill Frappier and Sean in hockey, Eric in cross country, Julie and Heather Ruma in soccer, Julie again in basketball, Steve in soccer, Tiernan in tennis, and Sean two times, again joined by John Sevigny in lacrosse. Mark again, both in golf and baseball. Most valuable players, headline Mark in both baseball and golf with first team all Eastern All-Star status in both sports. Sean, the same in lacrosse as the uh, All-Star, the MVP for the school and the MVP for the Eastern League in lacrosse. Sean's uh, performance in goal against Pingree was one of the most memorable accomplishments of the year. Somehow, he also shoehorned an all-star status in to hockey. John, Barry Jones, and Alex earned Eastern All-Star recognition in lacrosse. Katie was the charter member of the Berwick swimming team. Sarah, in her typically quiet manner, worked her way to the number one spot in New England fencing and to a national ranking in the Junior Olympics. We all know that the year has had its athletic trials as well as its successes. The class of 1995, numbering only 22, faced the Eastern Lake. It notched a number of wonderful seasons, especially in golf and boys lacrosse, and some wonderful games. This spring, the girls lacrosse game against Wheeler and the boys lacrosse game event against Pingree stand out. John sang uh, Rockin' the Boat in Guys and Dolls, but it may have fit better yet at that Pingree game. Certainly the Pingree players felt that way. The boys lacrosse team with Alex, Cutter, Barry, Sean, and John made it to the NEPSAC tournament for the second year in a row. The class of 1995 also set standards in the arts. Cutter, Andrew Morse, and Jason Fernald are the charter members of the National Arts Society at Berwick and all three are continuing on to college art programs. Cutter and Jason to the Rhode Island School of Design and Andrew to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Katie Kroll was late establishing her place in the art program but earned the last art department citation. Spring Swing found Katie Schulte singing Love is a Many Splendored Thing and Alex playing wild surf music on the same stage. And Guys and Dolls, Devon, as Nicely Nicely Johnson, Mark as Arvide Abernathy, Jonathan as Nathan Detroit, Steve as Joey Biltmore, Sarah as Agathy, Sarah and Katie as the Mission Band, Connor as Hot Box MC and Society Max, and Julie as General Matilda B. Cartwright. What good memories they brought us. Yes, the members of the class of 1995 were talented, are talented, very talented, but theirs is truly a case of the whole being much greater than the parts. Listing their wins, listing these accomplishments, listing their talents simply misses the point. Instead, we must look at the class as a whole. All of you who were here last night and shared in the baccalaureate heard Sean's CD story, Steve's waterfall tale, John's poem to his class, Heather's class reminisces, and all the rest. All of you understand that these talented individuals can best be appreciated as a class. The class of 1995, as a whole, as a class, has been a tsunami wave moving through the upper school for the last four years. As freshmen, the class of 1995 stood the blue and white competition on its head to the total amazement, dismay, and consternation of the upper classes. To some, tsunami wave indeed. How many years did it win that competition? The class of 1995 actually raised enough money to have a junior prom and have a little left over. Uh, there are a few cynics who believe the class figured out a way to make money from the junior prom. The class of 1995 logged more laps per student than any other class in the senior run. 
During it, Sean described Mr. Davy with a little bit of awe as the Energizer Bunny. Perhaps Sean was projecting. I see the entire class of 1995 as a gigantic Energizer Bunny, taking on every challenge Berwick, the faculty, the fates, and yes, even the administration could hand it. In the eighth grade, the class dealt with the first ever ethics class. And I must digress here a minute. For the record, I claim credit. I claim credit for first facing Devon's debating skills. After our debates about the possibility of absolute ethical standards, even censorship seems a tame topic. The class outlasted two upper school directors and took on the third. The class has met the challenge of the new science program with, with Mr. Davies' conceptual physics. The class has adjusted and has adjusted contract honors and Saxon math. The class took on the athletic challenge of its small numbers and stayed the course. The class has anointed a new senior lounge as well as seen Fogg Memorial through most of its renovations. The class has even matched wits and endurance with the original Energizer Bunny, Mr. Downey, as its class advisor. Even in its battles, in fact, perhaps most in its battles, the class and its determination have been evident. Remember Heather in the junior year criticizing the upper school director, that poor man, and the administration. Or Steve and Devin's struggle with the next upper school director over censorship. Given all of the experiments the class of 1995 has faced, it is fitting that it face one more, one more today on the day of its commencement. Oh, yes. This will take a minute, folks. Thanks. Oh, this may be just up there. We want to start a new tradition and place this class plaque in fog when it is finished this fall. It will be joined by the other classes and in fact we will march back in time. But we wanted to start with the class of 1995. I hope this is an experiment that the class will approve. with me a minute. At our fall convocation, I described the class as doers, as activists. I quoted at length Reverend Johnny Ray Youngblood's commencement address at Boston University, and I quote again at a little less length. We need men and women who both act and reflect, not just pose and talk. We need men and women who are deeply rooted and profoundly committed to democratic deeds and democratic practices, not political sloganeering and adolescent rhetoric. We need men and women with depth of mind, depth of heart, and breadth of soul. More Lincolns and Deweys, Parks and Kings, Chavezes and Arts. Not more spin doctors and media analysts. These were the champions of the human spirit. Tough, connected, in action, battered, triumphant. On June 10, 1995, how is that as a description of the class of 1995? Tough, connected, in action, battered, triumphant. Mark Spence inappropriately, because he is the class of 1995's sole lifer, struck the perfect note as Arvide Abernathy in Guys and Dolls when he sang, more I cannot wish you, more I cannot wish you. Your accomplishments and your struggles are now part of the Academy's history. More we cannot wish you on this hilltop. More we cannot wish you. We know not what awaits you off this hilltop. What will be your Pearl Harbors? What will be your Normandy landings? What hedgerows will you face? What baton marches will you face? Whatever your particular challenges, we can wish you that you carry on your tradition of activism, of doing, of togetherness, of being a class. Tough, connected, 
in action, battered, triumphant. More than that, more than that, we cannot wish you. Governor Alexander, Mr. Hatt, Reverend Christensen, Ms. Donahue, colleagues, families, friends, it is my honor on occasion of the Academy's 204th commencement to present the role of honor, the class of 1995. It's now my uh, pleasure to uh, present the salutatorian. Sarah Hamilton came to the hilltop in the fall of 1991 as a Berwick scholar. Her academic accomplishments include her induction into the Cum Laude Society and the Spanish Honor Society. Out of our sight, she has competed at the national level in fencing. September will find Sarah moving south to attend Duke University. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the salutatorian for the class of 1995, Sarah Hamilton. Good morning. When we walked nervously through the doors of fog on that first morning of high school, I doubt that any of us was thinking of this day. While we were living them, our high school careers felt like an eternity. And now that they're over, it seems we've hardly begun. Yet, in that short time, we have all become very different people from the ones who sat in the back of the assembly hall in 1991, listening to unintelligible announcements and trying to remember our schedules for the day. We were children, doing as we were told, trying desperately to impress each other with our maturity and competence, and working hard to make people remember us. We spent vast amounts of time and energy trying to be weird, just to leave an impression. Now, we stand out for being ourselves. Berwick has given us confidence in ourselves and our peers. We have learned our weaknesses and the weaknesses of others, but more importantly, we have begun to find our strengths. With this self-realization comes individuality, as we discover that we are not really who we have been trying to be, but that the young adults we have become are more talented and impressive than we ever dreamed. The true test, however, is not whether we are able to stand out here, but whether we can maintain our confidence and sense of self outside of this small, safe sphere. It is far more difficult to make a noteworthy splash in the ocean than to cause a ripple in a pond. Likewise, it will be harder to make a significant difference in the world than in a class of 22. Therefore, this is what we must take away with us when we leave Berwick, a knowledge of who we are and what we can do for the world. We must recognize our limitations, but never bind ourselves to boundaries that do not exist. This class holds enormous potential in virtually every arena, and we must not waste that. We have been given opportunities at every turn, and what we have not been given, we have made for ourselves. We have ganas, as Senora would say. We have the desire and drive to achieve. We have the persistence to stand up for free speech in the face of authority, the courage to navigate a raging river, the determination to pass a history quiz to win a bet with a teacher. We have the group cohesion to spontaneously go for an aimless stroll through a moonlit forest, and the individuality to not mind being alone. We have the creativity to debate the future of the human race or to cover the marker board with drawings of hay rides and buses. We are the doctors, musicians, engineers, artists, and poets of the future, each with a dream or two and the will and ability to make that dream a reality. Our innate talents were always there, but Berwick has brought us the self-possession we needed to bring those talents to fruition. I am inexpressibly grateful for being given the chance to be a part of the Berwick Academy class of 1995. There is no group whose ranks I would rather join. You are my brothers and sisters in the extended Berwick family, my closest confidants, my friends to the end. I thank every member of my class and the many teachers and faculty who have taken the time to make a difference. In one way or another, every one of you has helped make me who I am. At the end of the summer, when we go our separate ways, I hope we can remember what we have learned here that no one is without talent, that everyone deserves a chance to shine in the spotlight, and that strength comes not only from within and not only from without, but in the combination of the two. Good luck and thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We are honored today to welcome as our commencement speaker and the commencement speaker for the class of 1995, Governor Lamar Alexander. 
Governor Alexander graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Vanderbilt University, uh, where one member of our class, uh, Alex Holmes, will travel next fall, and received his doctorate in law from New York University. He served as governor of Tennessee from 1979 to 1987 and president of the University of Tennessee between 1988 and 1991. In part because of his educational initiatives as governor, he joined President Bush's cabinet in 1991 as the Secretary of Education. Governor Alexander's honorary degrees number more than the members of the class of 1995. It seems wonderfully appropriate that a person who has accomplished so much, an activist, a doer, is the commencement speaker for this class of activists and doers, the class of 1995. It is my distinct honor to introduce Governor Lamar Alexander. Thank you, Mr. Ridgway. Members of the class of 1995, family and faculty and friends. Three years ago, I was invited to speak at our daughter Catherine's high school graduation. So one night at the dinner table, I asked the obvious question. What should I say in my speech at Catherine's graduation? Our older daughter, Leslie, said, why don't you say what you said at my graduation? What did I say? I asked her. I don't remember, said Leslie. <laughs> I thought some more and none of us could remember around the table, which ought to tell you something of the relative importance of what I'm about to say to the class of 1995 today. So for the rest of this speech that you're almost certain not to remember, I have decided to tell you just one story. It's a story for you and for your parents and for your grandparents about a remarkable man who came to be a great friend of every member of our family. And what I hope you will remember about this remarkable man and his life are just six words. Find the good and praise him. This friend of ours was a storyteller, something we don't take as much time to do these days. As a boy in Tenning, Tennessee, population 973, he listened at the foot of the front porch steps as his great aunt and his grandma told the stories of his African ancestors that later became the stories of one of our most famous books. My friend used to say with a twinkle in his eye that his aunt and his grandma rocking on that porch telling those stories could knock a lightning bug out of the sky at 14 feet with an accurate stream of tobacco juice. <laughs> the world now knows those stories of my friend's seventh generation ancestor Kunta Kinti, the African, and how he was snatched from the forest by slave traders as he cut wood for a drum. Of his great grandfather, Chicken George, who wrote his friends still in Virginia that the soil was so rich in Tennessee that you could cut a pig's tail off and stick it in the ground and three days later a little piglet would be growing. Or of his grandmother, Queen, a slave whose father was Irish and whose, mo and whose story became a television miniseries just last year, or of his father, Simon P. Haley, and of his encounter as a young man one summer with another man on the train who then sent a check to North Carolina AT&T, which was just enough to cover tuition, and how Simon went on to be the first black graduate of Cornell and then to raise a family that included an architect and a teacher and a lawyer and my friend Alex, who turned all of those family stories into every family's story. The struggle for freedom, the struggle for equality, the story of roots. Alex Haley worked for 12 years on the book which won a Pulitzer Prize. It became the best watched television miniseries ever 
and transform libraries all over the world into places where people go to search for just who they are and where they came from. Alex Haley made our grandparents superstars and reminded us that some of the most important places in the world are our own hometowns. It was in 1980 when our family got to know Alex Haley. He was perhaps the most celebrated author in the world, and I was governor of his native state. He had homes in North Africa and in Los Angeles, and everyone seemed to know him. But in our family, we don't remember him because he was famous or because for a while he was rich. We remember him because he would walk into our home and pick up our daughter's essay and say something like, my goodness, Leslie, with a little more work, that could win a prize. Or to our son, Will, who was fooling around with a VCR, he would say, you know, Steven Spielberg started just that way. Or to all of us, he might say, do you know how lucky you are to have each other? Find the good and praise it. He always seemed to have time for anyone. Walking down the street in Knoxville, he met a man who couldn't read and he took time over the next several months to help him learn to read. And within a few months after that, the man found himself the subject of a story in the Sunday Parade magazine, Find the Good and Praise It. President Reagan, Elizabeth Taylor, uh, even Captain Kangaroo stayed in our governor's mansion. But the one that the state employees most liked to see coming was Alex Haley because he seemed to be even more interested in them than they were in him. Find the good and praise it. Alex Haley had a sense of humor that would keep you on your toes. It was not one of those syrupy kinds of sense of humor. For example, if he were here this morning looking out at all the families here and all of the generations, I'm sure that with a smile he would explain the mystery of why grandparents and grandchildren get along so well. He would say that it is because they have a common enemy. <laughs> I rarely saw Alex Haley angry, never heard him say an offending word about anyone else or about anyone else's race or background. Find the good and praise it. He especially liked to say those six words to people who were forever finding things wrong with this country. That was an especially powerful message coming from the grandson of slaves, from the man who wrote Roots and who wrote the autobiography of Malcolm X. People forget that he co-authored that one too. I thought about those words a couple of years ago in February on a bright chilly afternoon in Henning, Tennessee as an African flute played Amazing Grace and we buried Alex Haley next to the front porch where his grandma and his great aunt rocked in the summertime and told him the stories of his ancestors that became roots. On the marker there, which I hope you'll have a chance to visit one day, are those six words, find the good and praise it. You're graduating from Berwick at a time when a great many Americans believe our country is in trouble. Last summer, I took a drive across our country for two months between July 4th and Labor Day. I spent the night with people, many of whom I had never met before, including families in Maine and in New Hampshire. And I would ask them this question, looking ahead 20 years, do you believe your children and your grandchildren will have as many as opportunities growing up in this country as you have had? And most people were afraid to say yes to that. The daughter at whose high school graduation a few years ago that I gave such an unforgettable speech is now a college senior. She called home a few weeks ago late one Sunday afternoon. Where are you going tomorrow, she asked me. Out to talk with some people, I said. About what? About the American dream. There was a pause, and she said, Dad, a lot of my friends don't believe there is an American dream anymore. Perhaps there's some in this graduating class who feel that way. Perhaps some parents and grandparents who wonder about it. 
At least there are some pollsters who tell us that this is the first generation that does not believe that their sons and daughters will have as good a life as they have had. And I will never get out of my mind the middle school children who I met when I was education secretary in East Los Angeles. Standing on a corner there, they gave me a book of their poems, and it was entitled, Farewell to the Morning. That was their view of their future, a very different view of the future than I had growing up in a small town in Maryville, Tennessee, where my grandfather would say to me, aim for the top, there's more room there. And we all believe that. We believe that we could become the railroad engineer or the principal like my father or the president of the Rotary Club or a concert pianist or the governor or even the president of the United States. I know that my old friend Alex would want to join me in saying this morning, as you step forward from this hill, that it is important to be honest about our shortcomings as a country, but it is more important to remember this. It was our Statue of Liberty in Tiananmen Square, our song, We Shall Overcome, they were singing in the streets of Prague. It was mostly Bibles from this country that they smuggled into the former Soviet Union. Our revolution, our ideas of democracy that had spread all around the world. We are in some trouble in America. We are in more trouble than we need to be. Not only is this not the time to give up on the promise of American life, I believe there has never been more opportunity than there is for the class of 1995. We have simply moved from one era to another. It is not as hard, or it is, it is a lot harder to see the promise of American life today. It is not quite so clear as it was, for example, from your grandparents as they came home from that war that you honored just a few moments ago. Then America seemed to know who we are, what was most important, and what we sought to do, and where we sought to go. But today, every other country in the world has the same sort of confusion, the same sort of uncertainty that we have. There is only one big difference. We have more capacity to deal with those troubles, that uncertainty, that confusion, than anyone else. We have not only many of the great colleges and universities, we have almost all of them. We have 20% of all the money in the world for just 5% of the people. We are far and away the world grand champion in science and technology, the only great superpower left, still the only country where people run across the borders every night trying to get in. Because of your time at Berwick, you are specially privileged. Not only do you live in the country with the most magnificent opportunities, you now have more capacity than most Americans to make something of your life and of what this country has to offer. Congratulations. We are proud of you. Find the good and praise it. Thank you, Governor Alexander. Uh, joining me in presenting the diplomas to the class of 1995 is Don Hack, President of Berwick's Board of Trustees. I note today with uh, great regret that Mr. Hatt is moving uh, south to North Carolina in the fall. He assures me it has nothing to do with my job. <laughs> Thankless as his task frequently was, and difficult as it frequently was, Mr. Hatt has been instrumental in moving the Academy to academic excellence and fiscal strength. I hope you will join me in thanking him for his years of service as an overseer, as a trustee, and as president of the Board of Trustees. Mr. Hatt. The uh, plaque reads, Donald R. Hatt, Board of Trustees, President, 1994-1995, Distinguished Service, 
and far-sighted leadership. <laughs> Mr. Hatt and members of the Academy's Board of Trustees, it is my pleasure on behalf of the faculty to present the members of the class of 1995 for their diplomas. Molly Catherine Camp. <laughs> Corinna Choi. Katie Jean Kroll. Stephen H. Dow. Jason L. Fernald. William J. Frappier III. Please, Mr. Guy, come up. <laughs> J. Connor Guy. Caroline Hagen. Sarah Renee Hamilton. Eric S. Hiltonen. <laughs> Alexander W. Holmes. <laughs> Mr. Hutton, please join us. Robert Hutton the Fourth <laughs> Barry V. Jones. Devin M. Kearns. <laughs> Julia Kimmy Lynch. Tiernan Miller. <laughs> Andrew John Morse.
Sean C. Roberts. Heather M. Ruma. <laughs> Catherine Lee Schulte. Jonathan J. Sevigny. And if I could ask Mr. Svensson to join us. Mark Chesley Svensson. Congratulations to the class of 1995. The Cogswell Medal is awarded to the Academy's valedictorian. Poppy Hagen's commitment to academic excellence is the stuff of legends. It is the stuff even Marie Donahue can admire. She has been Berwick's ranking scholar and our academic standard bearer for seven years. She is a National Merit finalist, a member of the Cum Laude Society, and she is the first student in Berwick's history, I believe, to be inducted into both the French and Spanish Honor Societies. This fa fall will find Poppy traveling west to Carleton College. It is my honor to present the Cogswell Gold Medal winner and the valedictorian for the class of 1995, Poppy Hagen. of the class of 1995 because I have fared well in my studies. Yet some of the most important things that I have learned here at Berwick have come from my experiences outside of the classroom. During my senior year, I've spent time with both the first graders here at the academy and also the elderly at South Berwick Estates, just down the hill. The friends that I've made at these two places have perhaps unknowingly offered varied and insightful perspectives on the transitional period that we as high school graduates are experiencing. This past year, during the Big Brother Big Sister program, I watched the first graders raise their hands, eagerly shouting, me, me, I know, call on me. I watched them stumble over the crazy words in Dr. Seuss books, and I watched their eyes shine when they finally grasped the meaning behind the story. When I stop now and look back, I remember my own days in first grade. I realize all that these first graders here are yet to experience, and I see all that we have accomplished. What I notice most about the first graders, though, is their eagerness. Berwick has given us all that it can, and we are ready to move on. But I hope that as we matriculate to our different colleges next year, we can renew this eagerness within ourselves. We are heading to college, where a wealth of newness awaits us. There will be new things to learn, new people to meet, and new places to see. Devour the opportunities that you find with zest and an open mind. I'm confident that you will find opportunities because I have heard the stories. When I visited and talked with the elderly this past year, I heard countless stories of the adventures they experienced in their younger days. But their younger days are not first grade nor high school. Their stories are from their college days and those days that followed. This leads me to believe that the best is yet to come. The future is what we make of it, and our education here at Berwick has provided us with the tools to build any kind of future. Whether you plan to study in Massachusetts or Minnesota, or whether you plan to be an architect or an athlete, Remember that this time in your life is only a small part of the big picture. Be proud of what you have accomplished and know that it was just the beginning. I'd like to conclude with just a little help from Dr. Seuss. So, be your name Miller or Schulte or Jones or Alexander William Holmes, you're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way.
Thank you, Poppy. After our recessional, the class of 1995 will form a receiving line behind the seats. We encourage you to use that opportunity to congratulate all the members of the class. You are also invited to a light uh, buffet uh, in the Commons uh, following uh, the uh, events today. Uh, and also, uh, in uh, keeping with the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, we have uh, former faculty member Charlie Andres' paintings hanging in the lobby of the Commons, and uh, you may want to view those. Thank you all for coming, uh, for helping to honor and celebrate the class of 1995. Reverend Christensen will deliver the benediction. Please remain seated during the benediction and afterwards so that all can view the final march of the class of 1995. Reverend Christensen. Let's again be together. For the class of 1995, we pray. May God, who has guided and protected you in the past, continue to guide and protect you in the future. And may God so inspire you that in your continuing search for knowledge, you may also seek after wisdom. And that in your search for wisdom, you may seek after that which is just. And in your search for that which is just, you may also seek for that which is merciful. May God's blessing be given through you. As you live lives faithfully, may this world become a more humane and a hope-filled place for all of God's children. With God's blessing and to perform God's blessing, may we all go forth to live and to grow. Amen. Eventually, the rescue, you know, baby says they are the ones to be proud of.